I'm Melanie Parker, Google's Chief Diversity Officer. Thank you for joining us for Equity Talks, part of our equity learner journey to more deeply examine and understand social injustice through dialogue. My name is Kamal Bob. I am the Global Lead for Diversity Research and Strategy at Google. Today, I have the distinct honor of adding to our conversation on the search for racial equity, Adam Goods. He is a preeminent Australian uh, figure, the Australian of the Year in 2014, uh, and an Australian Football Hall of Famer, and a scholar of culture in the Australian context. Adam, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, welcome to the search for racial equity. Thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you. So if you would, in the beginning, um, I need to understand a little bit of Australian football. So clearly, and a significant part of your identity, uh, we'll get into other aspects of it, but a significant part of your identity is Australian football itself. So if you could explain to us in other parts of the world what that game is. <laughs> Mate, I played it for 18 years as a professional. I still don't know the rules properly. Um, it's it's an incredible game. Um, you know, the origins of Australian rules football, I believe, comes from a traditional um, game that Aboriginal people played called Maan Grook. And this game was played between um, an Indigenous clan and that clan would be split up into its kinship groups and those kinship groups would play against each other and sometimes you would have 50 on each team and they'd have a possum skin filled with charcoal and they would kick it, catch it, throw it, punch it around from one end to the other, back and forth and sometimes they would even play for days um, and that we believe the origins of AFL football came from um, the settlers when they came and saw this Indigenous game that our people were playing, and then they they turned that into the game that we know as Aussie rules football here at the moment. So in our game in Australia, um, very significantly, we don't wear pads, we don't wear helmets. Uh, sounds pretty crazy for a lot of Americans for the amount of time that we run into each other. Uh, it's very much a three-dimensional game. You know, every player can run anywhere on the field. There's no offside. Um, there's four posts at every end. Um, if you, it's, just, it's the only game you get rewarded for missing a goal. So in between the two big posts, you kick it through the middle, you get six points. If you miss, oh, well, it doesn't matter. You hit either side, we'll give you one point. Um, and the opposition team gets to take that ball out of the out of that square. Um, having 18 on each side and four reserves on the bench that you can sub in and out um, uh, throughout the game. And we play for two hours. So you have four quarters um, and it's very high scoring, um, you know, lots of running, lots of um, hits, big hits um, and... Um, you know, it's one of those games that if you're going to watch it for the first time, you need someone sitting right beside you to tell you, um, you know, exactly what the rules are and to understand the umpire's interpretation of the rules because that can vary as well. I appreciate that. And, and also, uh, just for some context, uh, clearly you're a Hall of Famer in that sport, but situate what that means uh, externally. Australian cricket, obviously, my family's from the West Indies, so I understand cricket, but I don't have a sense of how special to the Australian narrative is Australian football. Yeah, so this is a game that obviously we've created, and I have a very strong connection being a very proud Aboriginal man. Um, so this game here in Australia is what everyone knows, and it's the most popular uh, game from a uh, participation, especially in young ages, but more so that everyone knows about it and celebrates it. It's on TV. Um, so over 18 years playing professionally, I played 372 games um, and, you know, got the absolute best out of myself. But, you know, to be a Hall of Famer with my club, the Sydney Swans, um, you know, it's a huge honour um, to have you know, given so much service to to the game and my club. You know, I played at one club that whole time. I was drafted when I was 17. I retired when I was 35. Um, and, you know, it's something that I'll be forever proud of, that connection um, to the game, but more so to my football club and what that's given me um, over that 18-year period. 
So now that you've done that, if you would, I'm interested in a bit more now of, of who you are. You just mentioned as an Aboriginal player. Uh, we're going to have to explain now some terms here. Uh, again, the context of this is the search for racial equity. Uh, and typically, uh, the racial component of that search uh, is framed in a U.S. context where we understand kind of Black as, a, as an African diasporic uh, concept. Uh, relative to Europeans, wherever they may be. But in this sense, I don't really know uh, yet. If you could help us understand Aboriginals, the word itself, uh, the distinction between Aboriginal and Indigenous uh, relative to your own identity. Yeah, um, really good question. So Indigenous is an inclusive um, a word to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders as one category of Indigenous people to Australia. Um, Aboriginal is an Indigenous person to the land of Australia, but there's a lot of um, talk at the moment and a lot of Aboriginal people leading this discussion that they don't want to be referred to Indigenous and, you know, they want to be referred as Aboriginal or exactly where their tribal um, family and ancestry comes from. So for me, um, you know, if you look at a map of Australia before we were colonised, it looks a lot like a map of Europe with lots of different countries. And we would call them countries because every different um, country and region would have their own language, their own belief system, um, their own uh, cultural activities, which defined them as that type of person. So um, my ancestry is through my mother and my great grandmother's side and my tribal names are Ajnamatna, which is from the Flinders Ranges in South Australia, and Narunga, which is on the York Peninsula where I was born. Um, and they're very two different tribes. Um, one is very much a uh, ocean dwelling um, on the coast living and the other is up in the mountains, up in the rocks. So for me, being defined as Aboriginal, Indigenous, I'm not too worried because I know who I am. I know where I come from. I've been reconnected to my people in the last 10 years. But up until that point, I only knew that I was an Aboriginal man. I knew where we came from, but I didn't know how we were connected there. So in the last 10 years, I've gone on my own very personal journey into my own identity and my family's identity and connection to our Aboriginal ancestry. Relative to that, uh, clearly you're famous, so it was easy for me to read <laughs> quite a bit about you. Uh, and one of those facts that I gathered is that your mother, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was part of the stolen generation. Uh, so if you would explain what the stolen generation is, again, for folks abroad who might not know what that is. So um, in Australia, we had a government policy that allowed um, the police to go into Indigenous communities and forcefully remove um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children um, that looked not as black as everyone, so mixed race kids, and ripped them out of those homes, put them into... Um, uh, white foster homes to raise them as white children because if those children then have children, then those cast of children would have a lower um, Indigenous ancestry in their bloodline. Um, unfortunately, Indigenous um, heritage in my blood um, is a dominated um, uh, race. So whenever I've had children like I have, our mixed race is always um it is passed on, but it's a passed on at a quarter of the percentile, um, which is unfortunate for Indigenous people. But the government policy was, well, we could actually breed out that Indigenous in these people if we grab the children that aren't as black as the original um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So that was the government policy um, that was still happening um, not only, um, you know, 60, 70 years ago when my mum and her sister were, were taken by the police and put into um, a white foster family and my mum never got to see her mum or dad again after that and she spent most of her life trying to reconnect to her eight um, brothers and sisters um, in, in, in Australia. 
do you think uh, there's clearly a, a like a familial, intimate pain associated with all of that? Uh, what I would describe as barbarism. But what do you think the objective was? Was the objective to, you said, breed out uh, indigenous blood? Is there an element of uh, civilizing uh, intent as well? That is the presumption that because you're an indigenous person, you're uncivilized, and we need to just breed that out of you, such as you can be civilized. It's a it's an interesting question. You know, I have very strong beliefs about what they were trying to do, and I, I see it as a type of genocide. Um, for me, you know, it was only 1967, so we're talking 53 years ago, 1967. Any time before 1967, Indigenous people in Australia were part of the Flora and Fauna Act, so we were only ever seen as animals or plant life. Um, no, voting, no voting rights. The government had full control and power over everything that we did. They put us on missions not too dissimilar to reservations like they um, have done in America, and it was a set and forget. We made sure that they stayed on these lands. We had all the laws wrapped around to make sure that they were only allowed to be on those, those countries. So I'm very clear in my mind what they were trying to do and you know I'm really proud of my people and indigenous people here in Australia for being so strong and having that adversity to to overcome everything that's happened here in Australia and still be here standing tall and being proud of who we are there's a little bit of irony in that again my limited understanding of Australian history is the British arrived in the late 18th century uh, and there was some competition with the French, and it was originally uh, a penal uh, colony, as I understand it was a large one, and that a significant percentage of current day Australians are descendants of that penal colony. So if you would frame the way that you think uh, in the Australian context, the basic premise of, to be crass a little bit, but just to make my point, that the descendants of criminals are looking to civilize uh, Aboriginal people. How does that how does that weigh out in, in the Australian story? So the Australian story um, is built on a lie, um, and that lie being that when Captain Cook founded Australia, founded, which I was taught in high school as an Indigenous person, um, I learned that Australia was founded by Captain Cook. Um, and... The English were looking for lands. They had all these jail systems back in the UK that were overflowing and they needed to be able to ship those people somewhere else out of, out of um, the UK. Um, so when they came across Australia, um, they, you know, they weren't the first people to come to Australia. Um, you know, we had the Portuguese that had been, the French that had been, the Spanish that had been. We'd been trading with the Chinese um, from from the northern parts of Australia for for hundreds of years, um, and the English came here. And this terminology is really key to our our creation of Australia. Is that when Captain Cook came to Australia, they claimed terra nullius on the lands of Australia, and that's really important to the history of Australia, because by claiming terra nullius. That meant that no people, no civilised people were living in Australia. Um, they claimed that Indigenous people were nomadic, they had no law systems, um, and that this land was free for them to take. So by claiming terra nullius, they could claim Australia for their own. They didn't have to give sovereignty, they didn't have to sign treaties with the local people, they just took it and stole it from the indigenous people. Is that something that you had on your own to investigate through your own uh, educational inquiry, or is that something that is part of the education that Australians are offered? So when I got drafted to Sydney when I was 17, you know, I, view, I knew so little about what it meant to be an indigenous person, let alone a Ajna Matna or Naranga man. And when I got to Sydney, a, a reporter asked me, congratulations, you've been drafted to Sydney. What does it feel like to be an Indigenous role model? And in my own mind, I'm thinking, I don't even know what it means to be Indigenous and you're going to put that on me? 
So I then took it upon myself that you know I got to I got to educate myself. So I enrolled in um, the Eora TAFE, which is an Indigenous college here in in Sydney, and um, you know I did a, a diploma in Aboriginal studies, and that really helped me understand you know the the not only the the last 220 odd years since colonization, but you know the thousands of years of history and culture um, that, that that has come before that. What the, just a, a detail from my curiosity? I don't understand the word itself. Like Aboriginal, abstain, abscond. The ab uh, prefix implies something bad. So Aboriginal, where does that come from? Yeah, I'm I'm the same as as you, Com. I, I I'm really am unsure of where that terminology has come from, why that terminology has been used to identify our people. Um, you know, it's 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 one of those things that it's been happening for so long that people aren't questioning it, or there's other issues that we're we're trying to bring forward to 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 change before we even get to that one. Interestingly, um, in some of the dialogues that we have had on this search for racial equity, one of the um, the, the abiding themes is trying to make a, a global understanding of what this search is. And the description that you just uh, explained about the, the treatment of Aboriginal people uh, at the hands of white Australians, it clearly has uh, monikers and indicators of similarities to, you know, the Belgians in the Congo, uh, the German, Dutch, French, English, and the kind of Boer Afrikaner landscape in apartheid in South Africa, uh, even the segregation here in the United States. Uh, and there is a sense of a, a global relationship between indigenous people of color, uh, and Europeans in the colonial enterprise uh, in their time. So first, I wonder if you have a sense that indigenous people, Aboriginal people in Australia feel connected to this much broader um, social infrastructure around the world. We, we definitely do. Um, and, um, you know, it's only been since 1967 that we've been able to take out a loan to purchase a house to get educated really to have the same opportunities that everybody else has had here in Australia and um, we look to other places in the world for that strength you know we have a really strong connection to the Native Americans and their plight and struggles um, we we are constantly looking at the apartheid rules that um, you know were, were forced upon many blacks in Africa um, and for, for me, we, we had a document just as bad here in Australia called the White Australia Policy, um, and, and that wasn't too long ago either. So for, for everything that's happened around the world, um, which a lot of non-Indigenous people know of those plights and struggles, we only need to look in our own backyard to go, well, actually, we did the same to the Indigenous Australians. Um, um, you know, we're not so so good at looking at our own people here in Australia and what we've done to them. Is, is the white Australia policy the one that you're referring to that ended in 1967? No, so the, that was a referendum that was held. So Indigenous people stood up and wanted to be counted as citizens of Australia. Some Indigenous people were able to get exemptions, whether it be people who were boxing or played sport or were artists or um, people that showed that they um, could go to university. So there was opportunities, but you had to get an exemption to leave those missions and whatnot. So um, Indigenous people were still only less than 3% of the population here. So the White Australia policy was something that, um, they had to change in the, the 40s, 50s and 60s because Australia was going nowhere. And without the influx of immigrants to Australia, um, you know, Australia was going nowhere. And it was only because of that um, mix of culture and people coming over from Europe to have a second, third, fourth chance in life that Australia started to prosper and grow um, on the back of, you know, these hardworking immigrants that came here at another shot of life. 
So those two, I just want to be clear. So the 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 flora and fauna rule, it was that act. act. Forgive me. That was the one that ended in sixty seven. That was the one that ended in sixty seven, where where we we're no longer part um, of this act, which quite clearly stipulated that indigenous people um, were not human. Was was the the change? Uh, in 67 and the unraveling of the white Australia policy, was that a result of a, a an analogous civil rights movement, the kind of Soweto uprisings, the uh, independence movements in the Caribbean and, and in, in Africa? What, what catalyzed that? Yeah, it very much was the Indigenous people rising up, having a voice, but more so non-Indigenous people going, hang on, like, these are our brothers and sisters. We're marrying these people. They're people. Why do they not have the same rights as what I do? And it became a movement which we needed and we still need today, being such a small minority of people here in Australia, where we need non-Indigenous people to walk alongside us, to have that voice with us, because alone we can't be the, the, the loud voice for change. We, we need the majority of people supporting us and believing in um, you know, our values and our, and our rights. Before I ask you about uh, football itself, <laughs> which I'm dying to get to, uh, but explain to me, what, is it, what does black mean in, in Australia? So black to me is a you know, person of color. Now, I've been to Africa and, you know, I see myself as a black man, but I walk the streets there and, you know, I feel white. And it's a really nice feeling um, because I'm like, I like feeling like this little spot in a crowd of darkness. And that to me was like really, uh, really a special moment for me um, to, to do that because when I'm here in Australia, you know, I feel like I'm a black man, even though my skin isn't uh, completely dark. So um, black in Australia, I think, um, you know, from a, uh, any person of colour, it doesn't matter what caste or shade, you know, you know exactly what that connection means to you. And, you know, that's my connection to the men and women of colour around the world, you know. Um, when I see a person of colour who I've never met, there is a mutual little nod in the head of, hey, my brother, hey, my sister. You know, we, you know, um, you know, the struggles that they've been through and the struggles that you've been through, and it's just that mutual respect. I had an experience uh, when, to, when I went to Ghana for the first time. My family, as I told you, is all from Guyana, but the first time I went to Ghana into Ashantiland, uh, I was called Bruni, uh, which Bruni. means white man, <laughs> yeah. I might have ever been called white. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is an experience. <laughs> it is, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it's pretty crazy, but it's always like, you know what? You don't understand that, yeah. And there's no offense taken by it either, right? Not at all, not at all, not at all. It is uh, an affirmation, I think, of the continuity of our experiences. So yeah. let's talk a little bit about football. The, the um, Obviously, one of the, the the significant moments in your career is that you would reach the apex, the pinnacle of uh, Australian f football, uh, and then an incident with racial overtones and a confrontation with a fan, as I understand it. If you could walk us through a little bit of, of what that incident was and, and what happened thereafter. Yeah, sure. So to build a bit of context, um, it was a Friday night, the start of... Um, the round there's there's um, nine games that played every weekend. We were the we were the showcase start of that weekend's game. It also happened to be the start of the Indigenous round. Once a year, we celebrate Indigenous people, culture, and connection to the game um, in this round. So um, this was a night to celebrate, and I loved Indigenous round because it gave me an opportunity to celebrate who I am as an Indigenous man and to show people how proud I am as a, as a black man to, to play for my people. Um, so on this night, um, I was playing one of my, my better games of my career, um, which if you look back at my Indigenous round games, happened to be a, a, a great correlation that I would get up for those games. And it was about 
five minutes to go in the last quarter. Um, we're playing on the MCG, so where the grand finals played every year. It's probably about 60,000 people there. And the ball trickled over to the boundary and I grabbed it and I quickly handballed it to my team ball, teammate inside. And my opposition player just pushed me and he pushed me closer to, to the boundary line. And as I've just gone to get back into the play, uh, the field of play, I heard this voice go, Goods, you're an ape. And I took one step forward before I just turned around and I just pointed. I pointed at that individual. And I pointed and I said to the security guard, that person called me an ape. And uh, from that moment, the security guard came over, called some more security guards. As I've got back onto the field of play, the Collingwood teammate, who the Collingwood player who I was playing against, actually played at the Swans and we won a premiership together. He goes, what happened, mate? What happened? I said, mate, she's only 13 or 14. She's only 13 or 14. In my head, I just kept saying that and I sang it to him. And just as that happened, the um, our runner came out to us and that's the guy that gives you messages from the coaches and said, good see you come off. Um, it's time for a rest. You know, we've, we're going to win this game. So I went to the boundary I sat down on the bench for 10 seconds. I got up and I was so emotional. I went down underneath the stadium and in the hallway of the, the walk up to the ground, I just fell down onto the ground and, yeah, I was just so emotional, crying. I just couldn't believe that, you know, such a young person um, could, could have that courage to screen that out to me literally two metres away from me. And that just really cut me to my core. You know, I'd been probably six or seven years since I'd been racially vilified and to be have that happen to me at a game during Indigenous round, something I'm really proud of, you know, after playing such a really good game, um, you really cut me to my core. And, you know, that really rocked my world and, um, yeah, it was a it was a real struggle. So it wasn't um, it wasn't a common occurrence for you to be racially harassed uh, while playing. Um, it's happened three or four times. Most of the time, you can't you're not two meters away from that person, right? Yeah. So you might hear something and you look up into the crowd and it's just like a sea of faces, and you're just like, but I was so close, and I was like, that was you. I know it was you. I heard it was you. And for me, um, my whole life, you know, I've been vilified because of the colour of my skin, um, being Aboriginal. And my mum always taught me as a kid to walk away from that, um, to not call it out and to be the bigger person. She always taught me that if I reacted or was violent to those people, that they would keep doing it. Um, so once I understood who I am as an Indigenous person, what I'm part of, the culture, the heritage, I need to stand up. I need to have a voice. I need to point that out. I need to teach people that this is not on. Have you ever had the opportunity to meet that girl? No, but I spoke to her on the phone um, the next day because um, I knew it wasn't her fault. Um, I knew exactly that she was copying other people um, in the crowd. You know. No 13-year-old girl should know what calling an ape to a, a, a black person should be, right? And and her and her sister, um, her 16-year-old sister, they were both doing it, they said, and they had no idea of the racial um, overtones of it. And I just said, and they said, sorry, and I accepted their apology. And that was done and dusted from my point of view in relation to those to those two young girls. But that then started a bigger conversation around what is casual racism and what is and isn't acceptable when talking about um, calling people names. I think there's 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 another common theme here in the, the grace of forgiveness uh, that you clearly demonstrated there. And I also think just the, the willingness to teach even from a place of being insulted and deeply hurt uh, I, I'm quite sure that you changed those two girls, at least their uh, ideologies and worldviews. What happened next? Uh, uh, as I understand it, the the um, 
your being a recipient of Australian of the Year was subsequent to that incident. And then your acceptance speech was what brought some of these national uh, these issues to national attention. Uh, can you walk us through a bit of that? Yeah, so, um, you know, being awarded the Australian of the Year gave me an incredible opportunity to have a platform for 12 months to talk about things that I was really passionate about. One of those things being racism. The other thing being changing our constitution here in Australia. Um, uh, here in Australia, there is no reference in our founding document to Indigenous people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Still to this day, there is no, um, uh, no information whatsoever about who was here in the country before we were founded. Um, and that's embarrassing. Um, there's also um, laws within the document that allow racial discrimination. Um, you know, this is a document that was written in the early 1900s. It does not reflect who Australia is today. Um, and I was really passionate about, um, you know, that movement, the recognised movement, having Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people recognised in our constitution. Um, and also talking about you know, racism and the effects of racism. You know, I don't think people understand, you know, how it actually affects a, a person when you racially vilify them, um, especially when it's something that they've had to deal with their whole life. Is the, uh, what, I don't really understand uh, what Australia is now. So in the aftermath of that, uh, as I understand it, you ended up retiring from football I'm not sure of the coefficient of value on this particular experience relative to that decision, but if you could explain that for me. Yeah, so um, after I was Australian of the Year, I kept talking about, you know, Indigenous people, culture, racism, the effects of racism, constitutional recognition. Um, and, you know, what was so good about it was people were having conversations and people were talking about me um, and whether they were saying, you know, what I was saying was controversial, that didn't bother me because it meant people were talking about it and people were having conversations about it. I didn't care if people hate me. I don't care if people don't believe in my vision or words. Um, go on your own journey because what I'm saying to people are facts. Um, I'm not lying to them. I'm not trying to, you know, make them... Um, you know, believe in something that isn't untrue. It's about them going on their own journey and making up their own minds. And that's what I really wanted to do with that platform is to have conversations with people around what they think, what they believe, and what have they learnt in their journey in Australia up until this point. Um, and for me, um, it's always been about educating um, and having those conversations. You, as you know, we're going through a, kind of an American upheaval here, uh, the likes of which certainly people my age have never seen. Uh, in fact, just uh, yesterday, we had another uh, shooting of a black man, uh, Jacob Blake is his name. And this is all in the aftermath of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and these names that have uh, catapulted, uh, I think, around the world. In your acceptance speech, as I understand it, you uh, referred to uh, Australia Day as uh, Invaders Day, if that's the correct terminology, and the National Day of Mourning. One of the analogs to that is we're having a big upheaval here about the, the kinds of statues that we revere. Uh, Columbus Day is kind of uh, embedded in that uh, discussion because it's relevant. It's a, it's a similar pattern. So Columbus supposedly discovered the United States in 1492. There were clearly people here already. But the larger argument that we're engaged in now in the States in the context of this uh, kind of brutality that's going on is uh, a confrontation with history itself. And that dialogue here is very, very polarizing. It's even further polarized by the political uh, divisiveness of the country that we're engaged in right now. In, in your part of the world, uh, and that distinction between Invaders Day, National Day of Mourning, and Australia Day, 
uh, how is it? How does it play out? Is is it a is a healthier dialogue? Is it progressing? Is it helping to heal, or is it dividing? What's what's the status? Um, yeah, lots to um, talk about in that question. I think for me, um, invasion day, um, day of mourning is is you know something that um, we feel as Indigenous people because we're still not recognised here in this country. Our history isn't recognised. So the day that everything changed, of course, we still see that as Invasion Day and the day of mourning because nothing's changed since that, that moment. Only thing that's changed is our loss of culture, loss of land and connection to it. Um, so about, I don't know, 15 years ago, I made the decision that I can't keep putting this negativity and surrounding myself with negativity towards Australia Day. And um, I wanted to celebrate the good things, like we're still here. I still have my culture. I'm still connected to it. So we're now taking a spin on this, this one day um, that we should celebrate everything that's good. Yes, this is still a sad day to us. That's always going to be there. And unfortunately, that's not going to change, that sadness, because it happened. But what we can change is what happens right now. Um, so in Sydney and all around the country, they've been holding little festivals, festivals of culture, language, food, music that are bringing Indigenous and non-Indigenous people to celebrate that day in a completely different context and different way, that we're celebrating Indigenous people um, through their connection, their culture and their adversities that they've had to overcome to, to, to still be here. So there's a clear theme that's emerging here uh, about your own sense of grace, I think, and forgiveness, as I've alluded to before, and uh, what seems like a, a, a permanent sense of hope. In, in the documentary that you have, Australian Dream, uh, is that your intention? And perhaps tell us a bit about it, and then we'll uh, move from there. Yeah, I think um, The Australian Dream was a, a documentary that I decided to do with Stan Grant, who's the Indigenous writer on, on that. And the only reason that I decided to do the documentary is because the documentary wasn't going to be about me. It was going to use my story as a reference point to, you know, what people can, can connect to and what happened at that time part of the timeline, but it is a story of, you know, all Australians who have come here and have had the Australian dream. And a lot of people that have come here on a boat, on an aeroplane in the last 50 or 60 years, they've got an incredible story to tell about their Australian dream and how their life has changed. And this Australian dream is all about hope, but it is about hitting people between the eyes about what has happened to Indigenous people. And for the first time um, in a long time in documentaries, it is an Indigenous-led voice where it's majority of the people, uh, Indigenous people telling their stories and connection to their culture. Ironically, uh, again, the US educational infrastructure is relatively limited uh, <laughs> with information about the rest of the world. So I did. I was not exposed uh, to much about Australia. But the two points of entry, uh, interestingly, one was Kathy Freeman. I'm a track guy myself. Uh, so Kathy Freeman was kind of a hero. Uh, and then the other was the rabbit proof fence. And in, in both instances, obviously, one is a film and the other is a person. But I think that they uh, demonstrate a portal into the Australian landscape. And do you see your work as that? And then ultimately, what lesson would you like to uh, leave with us? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I love the rabbit proof fence. It makes me so sad that, you know, my mum didn't have a, a fence that she knew could would lead her back to her family that she could follow as a stolen generation um, uh, person. Um, but what I like about the Australian dream in the documentary is that it's now used as a teaching resource in our schools here and we've provided the resourcing around that. Um, it's not only 
a story here in Australia that um, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people can connect to, but this is a global story of um, any uh, minority around the world that has been colonised, that has... Uh, uh, that they're part of a minority in in their own communities, and they they you know have a real strong connection to my story, and they see that what happened to me as a as a child and through my adult life is what happened to them, and they can connect to that, and and hopefully see the the hope, um, and hopefully draw some courage that you know standing up and having a voice is more important, if not any other time in our life so important that we keep standing up and having a voice and calling out racism and calling out the injustices in in our communities so uh adam if you would there's another documentary that you were associated with in the final quarter uh, if i understand it correctly that has to do with the your ex your personal experience after confronting the fan and having to deal with the the direct uh, racist taunt that you received. Explain for us a little bit uh, about what what was happening in I guess in the final quarter. <laughs> yeah, so the Australian Dream and the Final Quarter were two documentaries, two completely different documentaries. Um, the, the Australian Dream was a documentary produced and directed by a UK production company and the Australian, uh, the final quarter, sorry, um, was produced and directed by an Australian team and, and friend of mine, Ian Darling. And the final quarter is an archival footage documentary that captures the last two years of my playing career when I was booed by the opposition at every game that I played for the last two years of my career. Um, and it goes on the story from the day I was awarded the Australian of the Year and from that moment on when the booing started, why it happened, we don't know. Um, but for me, I kept calling it out saying people that are booing me, I believe it's because of my stance on racism. I believe it was on my stance of talking about my people and my culture and people weren't respecting that. Um, so after the first year it happened, the following January, uh, so our season finishes in September, the following January, I handed over my Australian of the Year honour to Rosie Batty the, the following year, who's a domestic violence um, uh, victim for her family. Um, very sad story, but... I handed that over to her and our season then started in April that year. I thought that all that booing and all that crap of that last year would finish and I handed the Australian of the Year title back. Um, and then in April, that first game, that booing continued. And that was in 2015. It continued right up until my last game. Um, it got so bad in the middle of the season that it just it broke me. Um, and I had to have a week off. I went back to my traditional lands in South Australia to my people. I, in, I inputted my feet into the, the riverbeds and reconnected to Mother Earth and connected to my ancestors, which gave me the strength to um, go back, finish out that year, and it was only after I finished that last game when we lost in the final that I told my teammates that I won't be playing the following season, that my time's up. I've been subjected to this racist behaviour every game for two years now and I've got nothing more to prove. I don't need to give people a, an opportunity or platform to, to, you know, do that to me whilst I'm working. Um, you know, that's my job. That's my work environment. And I don't need to subject myself to that. And um, that final quarter documentary documents that journey. Um, and it, and it's, it's great because it's just archival footage, right? There's no lies. It's what people said and did and what I said and did during that period of time as well. And that leads quite nicely into the other documentary, The Australian Dream, where it is all about the interviews. It's all about a historical view of Australia and the, the relationship between uh, non-Indigenous Australians and, and Australia. That experience sounds remarkably painful. Uh, 
do you i have several questions about it but, but one of them is the idea we have it here as well obviously uh with these especially now because we have these we're a kind of a, a celebrity culture as, as you'd expect in the united states but there is a, a an idea out there of kind of cultural paternalism and cultural mascots and we'll will herald you and uh, bestow all these uh, accolades upon you. But as soon as you have an opinion that's critical of the infrastructure in which you exist, then you're no longer welcome. You have to be quiet, we'll boo you, et cetera. Do you have a sense of the, the weight, uh, the balance of weight, the forces of light versus the forces of good? So those that were organically booing you were clearly booing your, your defense of yourself and your identity relative to the Australian story. Who was defending you? Who uh, was, was, was it, because you, relative to what you said earlier, it was a guard at the game who escorted the girl out. So the people in the stands were protecting you, it sounded like. Uh, but in this final quarter, what was, what was the balance? Yeah, so unfortunately what you'll see if you watch the final quarter is the role that the media play in spreading lies about what I've said um, and also spinning um, things that I've said in the media um, to create um, outcry. Um, you know, we had one, um, you know, media personality who just took it upon himself to just spread as much lies as possible to people about the 13-year-old girl and my relationship with her and the, um, you know, how I was bullying her through pointing her out um, and, you know, that I was just, it's just really upsetting to think that the media played the role that they did and, unfortunately, the governing body, the Australian Football League, um, they pretty much sat on their hands this whole time and, and didn't really offer up any protection. They, they said the booing of me wasn't racially motivated um, and that we would like it to stop but didn't really do anything over that two-year period to make it stop. But you're right, you know, I learned pretty quickly that, you know, as long as I stayed in my box, I was okay. Um, but I wasn't one of those people to stay in my box. Um, I came late to learning about my history and culture. And if I'm now awoke to that, I want other people to know about our history here in Australia because I know what I was taught at high school, everybody else was taught, and that's wrong. That's false. And I want to help educate other people for them to go on their own journey and to experience, um, you know, the true history of our culture. If we talk about reconciliation and how we're going to reconcile with the first people here in Australia, then you've got to understand the history. Do you think that there's a sense... Uh Earlier, you alluded to the the kind of uh, uprising and the, the the movement towards the end of the Flora and Fauna Act in '67. Do you think that there's an there's a an analogous galvanizing moment now where younger Australians, uh, although they may be white, are beginning to see more clearly the the equitable humanity uh, across the Australian society? They definitely are, but unfortunately it's taken what's happened in America for us to realise the same issues we have here in Australia um, with our Indigenous people and police and the deaths in custodies that we've had here in Australia, um, that everyone um, became aware of the Black Lives Matter movement in America and we just then started referring to what's actually happening here in Australia and a lot of people's eyes became more open because of, of, of what was happening in America. So um, it's definitely had a flow-on effect here in Australia and unfortunately um, it's almost like we need to be shamed globally before we reflect on what's happening here in our own country. Is the, do you think that the... Uh, clearly, there 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 sides to this, but do you think that the collective response is to be open to internal critique? Uh, is there a movement afoot, or do you think it's just a defensive posture that those are international problems, American problems, Black Americans has nothing to do with us? 
No, here in Australia, we, we we do look around the world and see issues that happen and see, you know, we need to do something about that. And I think that reflection here in Australia has shown the Black Lives Matter movement here in Australia, which has been really strong and a lot of focus that has happened around that, a lot of marches, which I think has been really great. And it's given us, um, you know, other Indigenous leaders in the country the opportunity to, you know, remind people what's actually happening in our backyard and for them to actually become more aware of that. Is the pathway towards social activism for Indigenous people in in Australia through education or is it through kind of raw activism? And let me just uh, give you some context to the question. Given that uh, clearly I'm, I'm fixated on this 1967 idea, uh, so obviously there you haven't had generations of people who are progressing through to the highest levels of society. I'm quite sure that if we looked at the proportions of Aboriginal, of Indigenous people in the tech sector and the kind of core engines of the economic uh, uh, the economic structure of Australia, I'm sure that they'd be woefully underrepresented there. So what are the pathways for activism? Uh, for Indigenous people outside of sport uh, in the way that you have become a national icon and hero? Yeah, really great question. I love that question. And it, the same answer, I believe, is all the way around the world. Knowledge is power. It's about education. Um, my message to everyone that I work and deal with is education. Go to school, get educated, get a career, own your own business because with that knowledge and power creates wealth. Wealth is also another form of power. It gives you the the options to make decisions, decisions on housing, education, on health, all these three key indicators that affect the disadvantage of Indigenous people here in this country. So for me, it's not only education of our own people, it's education of the non-Indigenous people being able to teach Indigenous studies and history in schools now. Um, we've given our teachers, um, you know, the free will to teach Indigenous studies, but we're not giving them the resources to be able to do that. So you, you're what you're giving these non-Indigenous teachers the ability to teach from Wikipedia or, you know, the internet. You know, why not give them resources and connect them with Indigenous elders and communities from the areas that they're in? They're in. That, that's an, a great way to share knowledge and the indigenous local indigenous people would love that opportunity to teach the future generations about who they are and where they come from are there preeminent indigenous scholars who are providing that kind of curricular structure for teacher professional development and infusion into the national curriculum yeah we, we have some really great scholars here in the country um, we have some really um, highly skillful politicians that are great activists for our people sitting on both sides of government. Um, it, we just need more. We need more of them. We need, um, you know what we really need? We need our first Indigenous billionaire who has made a, a life um, through business so that our younger children don't just see sport as a way out. They don't just see music or the arts as a way out of disadvantage. Um, it, it really is that connection to education and education is everything um, for, for our future generations. Who are the, the, the institutional advocates for a broader and more inclusive education? By that, uh, again, we have this thing in the United States called the 1619 Project, which is analogous to what you're alluding to, where we're trying to teach the actual history of the country. And there's an enormous amount of resistance to that, even at the congressional level, to ban it in certain districts, et cetera. Uh, do you think that the, the, the tech sector or, or pr the private sector uh, can play a role in advocating for municipal responsibilities in education to force the hand of what you're alluding to? Yeah, that's definitely happening at a... Um, at a business level where corporates are engaging with indigenous businesses um, and people um, through procurement to create better opportunities for minority companies. Um, so um, I'm heavily involved in that in my, my post 
career life, sporting career life in, in helping Indigenous businesses engage in government contracts. Um, our education systems are a lot different here in Australia where we do have a national curriculum. We have a lot of the private and public schools that have a very similar curriculum, um, which, which is important. It gives the consistency, but it also gives the freedom for, for schools. You know, it, it's one thing to say to schools, you can now teach Indigenous history, but it's like, well, it's not still forced. It's not part of the curriculum. It's just a, a nice value add if you want to do it. Yeah. Do they do it? What's what's the status? Yeah, look, I have a fourteen month old daughter um, who obviously doesn't go to school yet, so I'm not overly sure. I know there's some communities and people who have jumped at it and loved it and have have tapped into resources in their community through relationships that they have with Indigenous people. So, for me, um, you know, I think it needs to be part of our national curriculum um, with set guidelines and set resources for them to use. I want to round this out here. Uh, again, the, the education part of it to me is central to the foundational pillars of what hope means and progress. Do you have a, a kind of a distinct message that someone uh, listening or even for me can take about the relationship between education as you position it and hope in a society that has the histories that yours does? Yeah, definitely. So. I finished high school. Um, the same day I finished my English exam, I was drafted to go to Sydney um, to play um, professional football. Um, my whole journey at the Swans has been about educating myself, educating myself about the game, about what it meant to be a professional athlete, what it meant to be an Indigenous man, um, to business management, um, to be a business owner, an entrepreneur. So for me, um, I've always been surrounded by people that have had more knowledge than I. And for me, I felt comfortable being around smarter people, asking them, being a sponge, wanting to learn from them. Um, so education for me was, was something that I really enjoyed. Um, and for me, education is everything. Every, everything we talk about in Australia, we have this closing the gap report, which um, measures the, the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people with health outcomes, with, you know, if you're an Indigenous person in Australia, you're 24 times more likely to end up in prison or go to prison just for being an Indigenous person. Your life expectancy as an Indigenous person in this country is 10 years lower than a non-Indigenous person. That's just the part of the facts. So these are the closing the gap report that the government reports on and has been reporting on um, for, for many years. The, <laughs> I laughed at this when I saw this in the paper the other day. The government came out and said, there'll be no gap between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people when we talk about prison rates and Indigenous people going to prison. And, There'll be no gap in 2072, <laughs> right? And I was like, why would you even come out and say that? <laughs> why would you, like, that's not, that's not good for anyone. So the one thing that is part of the closing the gap report, which is a real positive, is there is no gap between employment for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people when that Indigenous person has a certificate three or four. Now that's a that's a benchmark to me. So if I can get a student through year 12 and then get them to TAFE or university to get a cert three or cert four, there's no gap between them getting a job between them and a non-Indigenous person. Now that's a great that's a great bar for me to get to students. And I've got a foundation, I've got 500 kids on scholarship, they're all academic scholarships. And I say to them, we want you to get to university, finish university. We want you to go to TAFE, get skills, because if I can get you to level three or four, I know I can get you a job. I know that you're going to go out there and get and, and have a career and be a role model for your siblings, for your future children. And that's what it's about, creating those sorts of stories through education. Are the primary and secondary schools equally yoked? Do 
uh, indigenous students go to schools that are relatively segregated or are they kind of uh, integrated into other schools? Yeah, definitely integrated. Um, there's actually a call for a lot of our remote schools to actually teach in language and teach Indigenous studies um, for those students because the national curriculum isn't really working for um, those children in those remote areas. So it's about being able to adjust the curriculum whenever they can. But for me, all of the schools that I know of, um, there's no segregation. It is all about um, you know working together, assimilating, and, and teaching um, teaching the same curriculum. So, in those schools where there's equal access, there's equal performance all the way through. No, that's the that's the big issue. Is um, by the time an indigenous kid is going to primary school they're already um, starting two or three years behind those other students as they're going into um, uh, starting their educational journey. So I actually sit on a board, um, Australian Literacy and Numeracy Foundation, and we work with children from zero to five around their numeracy and literacy um, to make sure that by the time they start primary school that they're not already behind the eight ball with the numeracy and literacy levels. And that's really important to give them the same opportunity from day one to learn at the same rate as everybody else in that classroom. And, you know, unfortunately, we still have a lot of um, Indigenous students in high school that numeracy and literacy levels are, are so far behind their, their peers. So you've outlined the challenge ahead. Uh, education remains the portal. Uh, to the future? It certainly does and that's why I'm connected the way I am to you know the charities, the foundations that I've created and um, it's all about education. Um, there's a clear pathway, um, I can see it, um, it's about getting as many of our students and, and families believing in, in that vision as well. Adam Goods again, uh, it's clear why you are an Australian person of the year. <laughs> uh, I appreciate your having a dialogue with us about the search for racial equity. No worries, absolute pleasure, thank you. Learn about Google's equity learner journey on diversity.google.com and sign up to learn about new episodes.